You've likely heard the saying that love can transform even stone into wax. This tale is one of those, so let's begin. The story opens with the devastating news of a massive terrorist attack on America. The infamous Twin Towers have been destroyed, resulting in the loss of countless innocent lives. One man, who is intently watching the news, frantically picks up his phone but doesn't make a call. Instead, he begins to pray. Just then, a group of American commandos arrives and takes him away. He is taken on a journey across the world, eventually arriving at a place hidden from the eyes of the world. This place is a detention camp where the cells are open, but the prisoners are treated like animals. This camp is known as a data camp. Here, the guards rotate shifts every night, and new commandos are assigned every month. The man from the beginning of the story is now one of the prisoners. Now, let's fast forward to eight years later, in the same camp, where a fresh group of young soldiers has been stationed. Among them is a young woman named Amy. The soldiers stand in line as Superior Commander Rin gives them a detailed briefing about the camp. He instructs them to work in 18-hour rotation shifts and emphasizes the importance of checking on the prisoners every three minutes to prevent suicides. The prisoners are fully aware that escape is impossible, so they might resort to drastic measures. However, their lives are precious to the guards. Commander Rin also shares that some of these prisoners have been there since the soldiers were in high school. He stresses the need to refer to them as detainees and reminds everyone that this is not a jail, but a war zone where no bullets or missiles fly, yet the danger is very real. Rin warns that anything can happen at any time, and it's not about stopping the detainees from escaping, that's what advanced security measures are for. The soldier's true job is to keep the detainees alive, and from that moment on, they are fully immersed in this responsibility. Suddenly, Ren's walkie-talkie buzzes with a message that a detainee has been captured, and they need four soldiers immediately. Smiling, Ren looks at the soldiers and says, Why? You're sweating, right? He then raises his hand, signaling them to go. He instructs Amy to hold the detainee's right hand while they do the rest. As Amy attempts to follow the order, the detainee suddenly attacks, injuring her and even spitting in her face. Furious, Amy retaliates by kicking the detainee in the back. After the situation is under control, Rin welcomes Amy to the camp, and she returns to her room with a smile. This story is unlike any other, friends. There are no traditional battles or wars depicted here. Instead, it explores the emotional depth of the characters, which gradually grows so intense that they end up caring deeply for each other. How this transformation occurs is what the story seeks to portray. Later that night, Amy video calls her mother, who is visibly worried about her. But Amy reassures her that everything is fine and even mentions a nearby subway where she can enjoy good food. The conversation shifts to a girl, and Amy firmly states that she will not date any army man. Shortly after, the call cuts off. Amy is preparing for her night shift. Part of her duty involves distributing books to the prisoners, so she grabs the cart and begins making her rounds. Commander Rin accompanies her, and they approach one of the prisoners first. However, as soon as Amy gets close, the man starts yelling at her and hurls offensive remarks. Rin quickly intervenes, instructing Amy to move on and explains that this prisoner has a deep-seated dislike for women, which is why he behaves this way. Amy continues on and approaches a prisoner named Ollie, asking if he would like a book. Ollie responds by requesting the seventh book in the Harry Potter series. Amy apologizes, explaining that she doesn't have that particular book but offers to find him something else. Ollie declines, stating that he's already read all the other books and only wants that one. Amy suggests that he choose something from the cart, but Ollie points out that the newspapers are two months old and that he's read the available books multiple times already. Frustrated, he asks what the point is in rereading such outdated material. Rin intervenes and tells Amy to move on. A few days later, Amy is back on the night shift. She tries to avoid interacting with Ollie, as engaging in conversation with the detainees is against the rules. However, Ollie breaks the silence, asking her where she's from. When Amy doesn't respond, Ollie begins sharing his story, revealing that his name is Ollie, though the guards refer to him as 701 Ather. He has been imprisoned there for many years. He asks for her name, but when she refuses to give it, he playfully gives her a nickname, Blondie. Amy sternly reminds him that they shouldn't be talking and continues her rounds, but Ollie persists, making a noise to get her attention. He asks if she has read her holy book, the Quran. Amy replies that she has read it many times, along with the Bible, though she didn't like how the Bible ended. Ollie laughs, and Amy, slightly amused, warns him not to insult her book. Ollie then requests water, so Amy leaves to get some. Meanwhile, another prisoner, who is particularly dangerous, whispers to Ollie, encouraging him to behave better with Amy and to do something bad to her. When Amy returns with the water, the prisoner suddenly throws his feces at her. Enraged, Amy lashes out at him, but the other prisoners laugh and mock her. 
In response, the guards spray Ollie, causing him pain. When Commander Rin learns about the incident, he orders that Ollie be punished. Ollie is placed in a separate room and severely beaten. The next day, the entire staff goes on an outing, including Amy. She enjoys the time away and feels more relaxed. When they return, there's a party at the army camp. Amy ends up drinking heavily and eventually retreats to the washroom, where she finds some adult magazines left behind by the male soldiers. Suddenly, Michael, another soldier, enters, startling her. She asks if the magazines belong to him, but he denies it. The two draw close, but when Michael becomes aggressive, Amy pushes him away and leaves. The following day, Amy and her friend visit Ali's cell, where she finds a glass with intricate calligraphy on it. Seeing this, Amy wonders why someone capable of such beautiful work would choose the wrong path in life. She also discovers a note, which appears to be a suicide letter. However, Ali hasn't gone through with it yet, suggesting he may have changed his mind or has another reason for holding on, perhaps it's Amy. She contemplates whether Ali's punishment, referred to as 777, has broken his spirit. As Amy becomes more sympathetic toward Ali, she decides to read his case file. To her surprise, she learns that Ali is from Germany and has no connection to any terrorist group. He was detained merely because the US Army suspected him. The file also contains photos of Ali being tortured, showing severe injuries inflicted in an attempt to extract information from him, but he consistently maintained his innocence. Amy is shaken by this discovery and discusses it with her colleague, who insists that all the detainees are criminals caught for good reason. Her colleague suggests that perhaps Amy read an old file or misinterpreted the information. Although Amy seems inclined to believe her colleague, the encounter lingers in her mind as she resumes her duties. A few days later, Amy is assigned another shift outside the cells. She notices Ollie working on some sort of puzzle but says nothing and continues on. Ollie calls out to her, still addressing her as Blondie, and offers her the puzzle he has completed, asking her to solve it and return it to him. Amy declines, explaining that such actions are against the rules. Ollie, slightly exasperated, asks why her countrymen are so afraid of everything and whether she knows how to be happy. He insists that the puzzle is just a small gesture, a gift from him to her. Amy remains firm, reminding him that it's against the rules to accept anything from detainees. Ollie, sensing her discomfort, changes the subject and mentions that he knows she searched for the Harry Potter book for him but couldn't find it. He assures her that it's okay and that not everything in life can go as planned. Despite Amy's attempt to remain distant, it's clear she feels bad about the situation. Without saying another word, she quietly leaves. Eight months have passed, and Amy has become accustomed to life at the camp. She has learned the routines and knows the environment well. The atmosphere has become second nature to her. One day, as she is distributing meals, she notices that none of the prisoners on that floor are accepting food. When she inquires, she discovers that they are on a hunger strike, all in solidarity with a fellow prisoner they call 650. He had requested a machine that the army refused to provide, so his friends initiated the strike on his behalf. Amy approaches Ollie and offers him food, but he also declines. After a few days, the strike ends because the prisoner received the machine he wanted, which turned out to be a weight loss device that no one else used. Curious, Amy asks Ollie why they went on strike for something none of them planned to use. Ollie simply responds, because he is our friend, and that's why we all went on strike together. Amy finds this amusing and starts to laugh, and for the first time, she and Ollie share a more personal conversation. Ollie tells her that he is a skilled football player and can juggle the ball 40 times without letting it drop. Amy challenges him to prove it, so Ollie starts juggling the ball. However, the ball falls after just eight tries. Amy teases him, saying, it fell already. Ollie, a bit embarrassed, replies that it was because she was standing in front of him, otherwise, he could easily hit it 50 times. Both of them start laughing together, but their lighthearted interaction doesn't go unnoticed by Amy's boss, Rin, who disapproves of the friendly exchange. Rin calls Amy over and demands to know what they were talking about, but Amy insists it was nothing important. Rin, however, is displeased with Amy's growing rapport with Ollie and decides to punish Ollie by ordering him to take a bath right then and there, knowing it goes against Ollie's religious beliefs. Amy, uncomfortable with the situation, starts to leave, as she knows it is against the rules to stay, but Rin insists that she remain. Ollie, clearly distressed, refuses the order, explaining that it is against his religion, but Rin forces him anyway, humiliating Ollie in front of Amy. Amy feels deeply upset and Ollie is left feeling utterly embarrassed. Later, when Amy returns to her room, she reflects on the incident and realizes that what Rin did violated Arabic cultural norms. Determined to do something about it, she reports the situation to her superior officer, James. 
However, James dismisses her concerns, refusing to take any action against Ren, citing his seniority and long-standing service at the camp. He didn't want to tarnish Ren's reputation. Amy is disheartened by this response but finds herself powerless to change the situation. She returns to her duties, feeling increasingly conflicted. The next day, while Amy is eating, Ren approaches her. He knows that Amy tried to report him but failed. He subtly threatens her before walking away, leaving Amy feeling trapped and helpless. She starts to struggle with her time at the camp, realizing that many things happening around her are wrong. She begins to sympathize more with the prisoners, particularly Ollie, recognizing that they, too, are trapped in a place where they don't belong. Amy can't shake the feeling that Ollie is innocent, and the injustice of his situation weighs heavily on her. Here's the movie end and thanks for watching.